Alabama Public TV presents Spotlight on Agriculture. At Auburn, our agricultural research scientists are advancing food production, food quality, and food safety across the board. From meat to produce to baker items to candy, you can see the work at your local farmer's market and up and down every grocery store aisle. We'll share with you a glimpse of the work they are doing, particularly as it applies to meat such as beef, poultry, seafood, and freshwater fish. You will see how they are helping industries, both local and global, strengthen production while implementing greater safety standards. You will see how they are lowering production costs while increasing product quality, and you will see how they are working to make healthier foods more accessible to everyone, everywhere. From Auburn University and Alabama Public Television, thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoy the program. Our fisheries program at Auburn University is probably one of the best known programs at Auburn University around the world. As I travel around the world, I very often meet people who had some connection with the fisheries department here at Auburn University. We're, we're known for our research related to catfish, and again, Alabama is the second largest catfish producer in the United States. Uh, we're also known for the advancements we've done related to tilapia. If you're eating tilapia today, it's largely because of research that was once done at Auburn University. I've got three big projects right now, and then one project that's been going on for like nine years. The three big projects are the Impond Raceway System, where I'm working with my colleague, Dr. Jesse Chapel, look at the economics of it. The second one is this aquaponics project, a USDA NEFA grant, and we're developing a big program out of that. We've got a National Needs Fellowship as well, where we're gonna bring in five new graduate students this fall and develop a curriculum that will teach uh, students uh, to go out into the world and do uh, aquaponics. The third big project is West Alabama, where we have the catfish industry and diseases. Catfish diseases are the big killer of fish. It kills about 12 million pounds of fish per year. Columnaris, ESC, and, and virulent Aromonas hydrophila. I'm helping to coordinate the disease researchers to come up with vaccines, because vaccines are better than antibiotics and medicated feed. The public would rather see vaccine use than they would antibiotics. So we're working over there. This is the beginning of the fourth year of doing trials in these impond raceways, raceways where the fish are put in there and different treatments of, of catfish vaccinated in different ways. So we have really high hopes for that. And uh, if we can reduce that 12 million pounds of uh, loss per year, uh, we will be very successful. One of the main problems that producers, aquaculture producers have is disease control and uh, diseases are responsible for great economic losses for the industry. And right now, the main um, diseases that we have to deal with that the uh, farmers are trying to control are bacterial pathogens. And the three species that affect catfish production are Aeromonas, uh, Flaubacterium, and Edwardsiella. Uh, we've been working with uh, columnaris disease, for 15 years now, and I always tell people that if you ever had a goldfish that died, probably died from columnaris disease. It's very common in freshwater species, including uh, farm uh, aquaculture species uh, such as catfish. So of course with uh, any kind of infectious diseases, the best thing you can do is to prevent the outbreak or prevent the disease more than to treat it. It's more cost effective and it's better for the producer and for the animal. So one of the best things that you can do to prevent an infectious disease is to vaccinate your animals or vaccinate a person. That's what humans get vaccinated. So one of the things that we've been trying to do is to produce, design a new uh, vaccine against columnaris disease that is effective. We know that biologically the vaccine is effective and recently we have received a USDA NIFA grant to prove if the, vac the vaccine is cost effective. So we are actually going to take the vaccine out into the field. All the studies that we've done so far uh, have been in uh, laboratory studies 
uh, which pro proved that the vaccine worked, but now it has to be cost effective for the farmer. Working with columnares is not uh, very easy. Uh, as a microbiologist, I'm a bacteriologist by training, so it's not a very easy bug to work with. Uh, so it has taken us a long time to get to the right vaccine. Um, and uh, yes, I think uh, we hope that, that what we have right now, the vaccine that we have developed, that it has been patented, uh, I hope we can, it can prevent columnar disease. It's never going to eradicate the disease because this bacterium is present in the aquatic environment. So it's going to be basically impossible to eradicate, but we hope we can prevent or at least minimize the losses that are caused by columnar disease in the industry, in the catfish industry, and uh, theoretically in other parts of the world because columnar affects many freshwater species such as tilapia and other uh, freshwater uh, uh, fish that have been cultured. What I like people to know that a lot of people don't know is that fish, as any other animal, they get sick. And there's things that you can do to prevent that to have, from happening. Um, and we can use vaccines. Uh, vaccines have been around for a long, long time. They have been proved to be very, very effective in reducing the incidence of infectious diseases or even um, eliminating diseases that used to be uh, very, um, globally uh, distributed and very uh, affecting humans and, and, and other animal species. So, so we are, what we're trying to do here is to make sure that our animals are raised in a sustainable way, in the most effective way as possible, and to achieve the best uh, healthy fish that, that you can get. Of course, you, you, you've, we've seen the uh, raceway systems, and that's one of the big things that we're working on now is a, is a uh, vaccine for some of the diseases. Back to, actually, we have three vaccines that are being tried in these raceways as we speak, and there's three major bacterial problems that we face in these farms and on with the catfish, and that's what we're trying to do is perfect these vaccines. What they have is a different ways of vaccinating. We have three different types of vaccine type uh, vaccination uh, processes. One's an injection, one is an, a, 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 uh, an immersion, and the other one is a uh, different type of immersion that has a longer period of time, and then you have a control. So you have three different tests actually going on with the, in, these rest, in these raceways, and then you have four replications going on so that you can supply, uh, apply statistics to the results of the test that you're doing. So this is a scientific, actually a scientific program, and the young gentleman that was there, that's his master's degree uh, thesis that uh, is being uh, processed here. As a, the extension aquaculture specialist that's stationed off campus, uh, my job is to uh, work with the, the catfish industry on, on problems that, that arise that are related to aquaculture and uh, water quality and uh, production of, of catfish. So we work uh, really closely with, with faculty that are on campus and try to get them engaged with the aquaculture uh, industry in West Alabama and try to, to take advantage of, of the, the talents that we have uh, on campus at the university to help solve some of the, the problems that, that the catfish industry is facing. In Alabama and, and the other uh, states that, that raise catfish, we're, we're producing a, a very safe and, and nutritious uh, product. And, and over time, you know, as, as the population of the world uh, is continuing, continuing to grow, uh, we need uh, safe and nutritious uh, sources of protein uh, for, uh, for feeding ourselves and, and for feeding the world. And, and catfish is raised uh, in, in the United States, uh, the, the way that we, we, we raise catfish is very uh, environmentally friendly, uh, sustainable, and uh, the production techniques uh, that we use are, uh, are, are very, uh, effective in producing a, a quality product for, for the U.S. consumer. The Alabama Fish Farm and Center uh, serves as a, a satellite laboratory uh, for the School of Fisheries, uh, Aquaculture and Aquatic Sciences at Auburn University. 
And so we, we provide uh, diagnostic services as well as uh, water quality uh, testing services uh, free of charge for, for the commercial uh, industry in, in West Alabama. So farmers can have problems uh, in their pond with water quality and uh, bring us a water sample. We can test it and then provide uh, recommendations on, on what they, they should do to, to improve the, the water quality of the pond. This farm produces around 8,000 pounds per acre, uh, which runs about 11 to 12 million pounds a year. Uh, generally, we sell fish year round. We have a processing that we try to come in here same uh, weekly. We have different days we deliver on and we're scheduled on each day to deliver our product to the plants. You think about the farming in this area, we, we, we buy trucks and tractors and equipment. We uh, employ a lot of people on the farms. As Alabama farmers, uh, we have generated a, a pretty good uh, background for the industry. We have bringing quality feed. Uh, from other locations, our feed is brought in locally to the state of Alabama to our feed mill that's located about probably 15 miles down the road from us. Uh, it's shipped in daily, it's fresh grain, and then that, that enables other people outside of our state to even draw income from what we're doing in, in Alabama when raising catfish. Uh, we're grain fed, which is high protein feed. It's very much a clean environment, uh, very natural to what we do in the world. Our water is very much consistent of the same type of thing. We bring natural rainwater. We use aquafloor to our that we have under our, under our ground here. We use wells that are dug about 600 feet deep, and that brings the good water from the bottom of the, of the earth up to the top, and then the, actually what the good Lord gives on top of the earth back down to the bottom. And that way we got a good natural resource of soil and the water and the grain. And the economic development for us is, is, is greatly accessed, spread around the parts houses. Uh, pretty much everybody in the area gets a part of our income because we're having to buy and support things around the area. There's things on the farm that we use a lot of younger people involved in to get them encouraged in what we're doing. As far as some of them being auction checkers, they want to check ponds. Uh, there's a lot of jobs you can bring in here with the youth that Auburn's worked really well with trying to bring young guys to our resources. I have in past history have used a lot of their labor they've brought from their schooling to our farms. We want to bring young people in and show them this can be a very much a long future for them. And we have probably 70% of our farming right now is in the 20 year old range. So we've really been a big focus on trying to bring youth in, young people in, to get them encouraged in farming. And not, if they want to be mechanics, they want, might want to be a fab guy to build paddle wheels. At, at, here at Wisdom Cattle Company, we offer all of those opportunities. A young person that would like to get into either the catfish industry or working with natural resources, rivers, reservoirs, and wild populations of fish. We have at Auburn University and the School of Fisheries, Aquaculture and Aquatic Science is a place for them. Uh, we have a full curriculum undergraduate, but we do a lot of graduate studies as well. So somebody could come here and get their undergraduate, or if they got their undergraduate somewhere else, they could come here. We get a lot of jobs in the catfish industry, but a lot of our students leave here and they work for aquaculture sectors around the United States and around the world. Uh, because we have had, uh, gosh, I don't know how many countries, probably 80 countries we've worked in around the world since the 1960s. And uh, a lot of their students came here and they got their degrees here. They had a wonderful time. The War Eagle uh, atmosphere permeated them. They went back to their countries and now they're the leaders of their fishery industries and aquaculture industries. So they continue to have contact with us and send students here. Auburn has a very long and, and very rich history with aquaculture back in the 60s with Homer Swingle. We, we've been along with aquaculture throughout its development in terms of um, coming from a very small, um, non-commercial entity to a very large commercial entity that it is today. Um, Auburn has had a very big impact in terms of development of technologies, transferring of those technologies, and working with the farmers. We have a uh, fisheries science building out in West Alabama that works on a daily basis with farmers where they bring in water samples, disease issues, any problems that they might have to interact with our specialists uh, to support that industry. So from 
the historically and from the future, um, Auburn has had a very significant role in continuing to develop the catfish industry. So some of the innovations that have been developed here at Auburn University include sex reversal of tilapia, going to produce all male tilapia. That technology was developed here and promoted through Auburn University. So the entire tilapia production worldwide is based on sex reversal. In terms of gender of fish, quite often the male grows faster than the female. So in, in the case of tilapia, the female starts reproducing very early in the life stage when they're only four to six inches long. And so taking that female and, and switching her sex to a male um, allows her not to reproduce um, and then grow faster. So instead of having a population of large fish and small fish by doing a monosex, which is typically all male, specifically in tilapia, you get a un more uniform fish and you don't have those smaller fish in the production system. So it's very important in terms of economic returns to the farmers. So in terms of, of feeding the world, because our population is growing and we need a huge amount of protein in order to feed the current population, as well as we have people who are poor who are increasing their income levels, and when you increase your income level, you have a tendency to buy more protein. So eating seafood, eating more protein is on the rise worldwide, and we need to have a source for that. Aquaculture right now produces just over half of the world's seafood production. Production of tilapia, catfish is part of that equation to provide a healthy, high protein, quality food source for the people. Raising fish through aquaculture is very sustainable. We're using a lot of cereal grains, so corn, wheat, rice, um, as carbohydrate sources. We're using a lot of proteins that are grown um, for row crops. So for example, soybean meal is probably 20 to 30% of the diet for aquaculture animals right now. So it's a major protein source. And that's very sustainable, very renewable, and very expandable. So aquaculture as an environmentally sustainable and responsible resource, it's a great way to produce high quality protein for the future. Um, of our people. Fish um, in this country is a fairly large protein source that makes up a good portion of your plate, but in many countries fish is even a larger component of the protein intake. And fish is not only you know, a nice protein source, but it has a lot of vitamins and minerals in it which are very good for particularly poor people who may not have the nutrition that they need. So expanding aquaculture um, in our third world countries or developing countries is a major way of bringing high quality protein sources to those poor people. And so it's a great way to increase their revenue so it provides jobs but also provides high quality nutrition for our local people. My lab primarily spends most of its time looking at how to improve these diets for these animals. That means we're looking at nutritional requirements, refining those nutritional requirements because the better refined a requirement the better we can design a feed, which means it's much more cost effective. There's also numerous ingredients in terms of quality um, and quantity that can be used in a feed formulation that we look at different levels, uh, different quantities of, new of ingredients that are being used for those feed formulations. And then there's all sorts of new ingredients that are being created or invented every year. For example, we have different algaes, we have different bacterial biomasses that are currently being produced or byproducts from other agriculture industries that are being transformed into food ingredients that we use in agriculture. And so one of my jobs in the laboratory is to look at all these new ingredients or improved ingredients and how they can be used in aquaculture, converting byproducts into a final quality product. The goal is not only to provide proper nutrition to the fish so that it grows fast and becomes economical for the farmer, but also to produce a healthy, quality food product for human consumption because the end user of the fish that we produce is a human. And so we want to make sure that the fatty acid profiles, the minerals, the protein content is all appropriate for human consumption. And so that is things that we do in aquaculture, is that we can essentially change the composition of a lot of these um, protein sources to improve it for human consumption. Really what we've turned out is people. And the people that, uh, that have passed through this university over time, whether they were in the research environment or the, the production environment or whatever, whatever aspect that they went on to, to do after they left Auburn, that footprint is global. And uh, we have friends and associates that, w that work in aquaculture that, that I came to school with, for example, or others did after I was here, uh, that are big, very big, strong global, global reach. And it's, it's really a, a fun thing to be involved 
with an industry like that where you've got friends all over the world uh, doing some of the similar kind of things that, that we are here at Auburn. Well, you know, some of the biggest challenges facing our industry guys today, as always, in any kind of farming is, can I, you know, can I do this and sell this product for somebody who wants to buy it and eat it or consume it in some way for more than I've got in it? I mean, that's farming in its essence. So being competitive is the name of the game. And our guys uh, in West Alabama that are in, that are in the fish farming uh, business are doing that in such a way that they are still competitive after many, many years in doing this. Uh, we are trying to, trying to teach them new technologies, different approaches or whatnot, where they can be more efficient, not just in producing more fish per se, but in producing them more efficiently. We are using less and less water to produce these crops of fish. Uh, and in fact, we're using probably half the water now that we did you know, 15, 20 years ago. So that's this water conservation, conservation and wise use of energy, as well as using nutrients that are, that are you know, critical to growing any kind of animal. We do that in such a way that we want, you know, we, we're, we're making sure that the farmers have the, the nutrient packages that we can push through these fish to make it where they're not producing as much waste. They're more fully utilizing that nutrient investment. Uh, here at Auburn, we in, on the aquaculture station here, all of the water we use is collected rainwater. We don't use well water because we don't have any wells. Uh, and we've learned how to be very, very frugal with that water over many years of doing this. And we try to, uh, to teach that and, and uh, instruct that as we are working with, uh, with producers in West Alabama. But the whole idea is using less of that <laughs> extremely valuable resource that we enjoy a lot of here in Alabama. We're probably the most water rich state in the country, but I think that gives us even more responsibility to understand its wise use. Uh, so using that water resource very, very frugally in production makes us uh, uh, more and more sustainable. A lot of our competitors around the world don't use sustainability practices as a, as a part of what they do. They don't, they don't use that. They just use whatever is uh, expedient for the moment and for them, okay, that works. But here, we're very much more interested in taking care of the environment that feeds us than probably some places are in the world. You know, a lot of young people that I talk to uh, don't know where they wanna go or what they wanna do when they are older. And uh, I think that's kind of normal. Uh, but at the same time, if a young person wants to kind of see what's going on in the world and see what might be happening in the world of agriculture, in our case in particular, aquaculture, we're more than happy to have them come visit us here. Uh, we can show them more in two hours than they are, have any idea that happens here in Alabama. And all of that show and tell, if you will, translates in, into us being able to teach them, train them, and make them prepared for a job within this ag sector that is very large and very, uh, uh, very economically important here in Alabama, but, but also in the, in, the, in the country as a whole. Um, the off-bottom oyster that we're, we've worked with folks to get going is really producing a product that is intended to go to that premium half-shell market. A lot of the stuff that comes off of the reefs here in Alabama, that's usually going to a shucking house. Those oysters are being shucked, and they go in sacks of oysters, go to the house, and they get shucked. And that's a great thing, too. I like my fried oysters as well. By adding off bottom oysters, we've added a new product to what we do. It doesn't compete. They're going to different markets. Uh, the value of that really has been, in 2009, we had no oyster farms in Alabama. Now we're up to, I think the most recent survey we did was last year, and we had 15 oyster farms now going in, in the state, um, all, in, all in the coastal, coastal section, obviously. And of that, we had about 2.6 million oysters were harvested, and they had a wholesale value of about $2 million. So it's, you know, it's starting, um, but we're in that place where people are starting to see that they can do this. It's a way to make a living. Um, and so we're seeing people expand the farms that they've got, and then we see people applying for new permits. One of the things that was really important coming from Auburn University and Cooperative Extension here was thinking about what, what fits with our coastal communities. And so we wanted to try to find something that builds on the tradition and the skills that folks have in places like Bayou Labattery or Codan 
And so people know how to work on the water. Um, they know how to work hard and they know, they know a lot about oysters. So all we were trying to do was say, is there, is there some tweak, is there some spin that we can put on that that will provide a different opportunity than what they've had? And that is where we've done this off-bottom oyster farming. And so really the, the step forward here was that we looked at what was being done in other parts of the country where using hatchery reared seed and using baskets to protect them from predators. And we saw that that was working there and we tried to see like, how does that work here in the Gulf of Mexico? And we did have to do, we had to do some research. We had to try to look at some things about what would work here. And when I say work, it, you can ask a biologist what works, but it also has to work in the end. It has to work so that people can make money at it. And so we were trying to evaluate both those things, like what works in terms of having good oysters uh, grow and survive well, but how can you do that in a way that's cost effective? So like here at the Auburn University Shellfish Lab, we're here at the Dauphin Island Sea Lab campus. So here at the lab, we do a lot of production science research. We're doing a lot of things to actually not only have an oyster that grows better and survives better, but we actually do start to look at some of the things I would call quality. So we've done quite a bit of research looking at the uh, shape of the oyster and the cup of the oyster. Anybody that eats raw oysters, you always like when they pop open that oyster, you always like it to be a nice deep cup with a, a really fat, plump oyster in there. You know, you don't want a skinny little potato chip. And so, believe it or not, it looks like that there are both genetic components to that and then um, cultivation components to that. There are decisions that the, that the farmer makes on the farm that helps dictate that shape of that oyster. And so, one of the things we've done is we have looked at the research of well, so what are those things that you do and how much does it affect it? And that way a farmer can make an informed decision about what they want to do on their farm. And some of them decide to do some of these things and some don't, but at least we're giving them the information to do that. I think one of the things that actually is really great about oyster farming as well for me has been um, oyster farming is pretty sustainable. Um, we are very lucky in that when you grow an oyster, um, they eat the microscopic plankton in the water, the phytoplankton. And that means that they eat the plants in the water. We don't have to feed them, which also means we don't medicate them. And we're growing a native species, so essentially we're letting these farmers, we're letting them do what nature does, except they're able to provide very high um, survival. They give something where the oysters grow very well, survive very well, and the quality is consistently top notch. And so you're really just, you're not doing anything that nature doesn't do, you're just providing a consistently high quality product out of it. So environmentally, that means that you're not putting a lot into this. Um, it turns out that there are actually some benefits from it. So you put these oysters in the water and they help graze down that extra green in the water. Green isn't dirty necessarily, but uh, usually we think of water as a better ecosystem. If the clearer the water, the more sunlight gets to the bottom. So when I look at oysters, I think of them as sort of like putting sheep out into an overgrown pasture. And so when we put oysters out, it doesn't matter if they're on a reef or on an oyster farm. Those oysters are eating the green out of the water and making that water clearer. So there's a benefit there. We actually do run a shellfish hatchery. If you run an oyster farm, then you need oyster seed. So we got all these oyster farmers interested in oyster farming, which is great, and they want to start farms, but they needed seed. And so we were in the position of here at the shellfish lab, we actually run a hatchery. And all that means is we just go get oysters, we bring them in here, and they reproduce here in the hatchery for us instead of out in Mississippi Sound. And then, again, we can maximize the survival. They're microscopic larvae that swim in the water for about two weeks. And so we do that uh, here at the hatchery. Uh, we run those tanks for about two weeks. And then at that point, that microscopic oyster is looking for a place to settle down. And we, we provide them little pieces of, we call it culch, but it's basically pieces of uh, oyster shell that's been ground up into dust or sand. And they attach to that, we call that setting. And then at that point, under a microscope, it would look just like the oyster that you eat later. It's gone through uh, its, its life cycle, it's ready to grow now. And then we have nurseries out there. And in those nurseries, that's where we just turn on the water from the Gulf of Mexico because it has food in the water and we just let that water flow by the baby oysters and they grow there. And at some point, anywhere from a very small speck to maybe the size of your thumbnail, you're gonna take those oyster seed and you're gonna provide those to the oyster farmers and that's, that's how they stock their farm every year. Auburn come in and introduced us to what we're doing. So they come in and pretty much laid a foundation and you know, opened some doors and showed us what was out there and and you know we're commercial fishermen 
by trade and you know we were in the shrimp inside and you know we knew of oysters but what we knew of oysters was on bottom we knew that it was something that we was gonna have to pour our hearts into and give it a hundred percent but but that's okay because that's that's who we are and that's really what we came from as far as, as far as shrimping being able to work with Auburn hand in hand you know it's <laughs> it's a comfort to be able to pick up the phone and you know talk to Dr. Walton it's it yeah it goes a long ways as far as you know feeling okay feeling like you're doing stuff the right way and just have somebody to call and talk to when you know you get kind of out of your league sometimes what's really nice about this is we've got oyster farmers out in our waters here growing waters in Alabama's waters and genuine Alabama oysters and so yeah I think it's certainly expanding that and it's a high value industry we will expand production here in Alabama but you know frankly I think it's something we're going to see across the region. We've seen this take off in Florida. Um, Louisiana's got some oyster farms as well. We, we've partnered with our colleagues over there at other universities to work with their folks. And Mississippi is about to get, uh, permit a bunch of areas for this summer. So I think that what we're doing in Alabama will grow, but I think it's part really actually of a regional story happening across the Gulf and actually right into the Carolinas and Georgia as well. This is a really great opportunity for the state. It's something that we've seen Look, you go to a lot of these rural fishing communities in our state and along the coast, they're not necessarily going in the direction that you would like a community to go. So when I look at off-bottom oyster farming, I don't think it's a magic bullet or anything like that, but it is providing an opportunity in these communities for people to make a living and provide jobs and to keep families together. For me, that's a big thing. If you, if you grew up in these communities, why do you stay here if, if the fishery that you were relied on as a family isn't working? Well, maybe you go into off-bottom oyster farming. So for me, I think that's a critical part of it. I think as we see this industry expand, we're going to see a number of farms try to increase their, their production. And so we get to the point where it's not just a mom and pop operation anymore. Now they need to get some skilled people there. We've seen people add farm managers. We've seen people add nursery operations. Uh, we've seen people now starting to add their own hatcheries in. And those are all things that require skilled people who know what they're doing, um, know how to handle themselves on the water, know what they need to know about the biology of the oyster so that they can spawn these oysters um, and raise up their larvae to produce the oyster seed for these farms. So I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities and we're going to see those opportunities then also then there's going to be wholesalers that now need to know that product and what that means and then of course then you get down to the end where you also need chefs and shuckers that know what they're doing with that product as well so to me i think this is something that we can add to what we're doing it enhances the tradition that we have here in alabama of, of oysters and loving oysters but it also is going to create some opportunities for jobs We also do an extensive amount of research related to beef cattle production in the United States. Uh, beef cattle production is also the second largest uh, enterprise, agricultural enterprise in the state, and it's an important part of our economy. Uh, one thing that we've noticed is uh, increasingly the, the cattle that we're delivering to the market are uh, improving in quality, and so our producers are earning more from the cattle that they're producing today. The beef cattle industry can be separated into three basic segments, the cow-calf industry, the stalker industry, and the feedlot industry. Because Alabama is located in a region of the country where we have a significant amount of rainfall, we have the potential to grow tremendous amounts of forages for livestock grazing, uh, Alabama is well suited for supporting the cow-calf industry. In the cow-calf industry, there will be a, a farm or a ranch that is responsible for producing calves, calves like you might see in the, the group of cattle that we have here, that would be used to then go to uh, the stalker program and then go to the feedlot program where they would then eventually be harvested for, to provide uh, high quality protein for human consumption. Also in Alabama with the cow-calf industry, we have a seed stock industry. The seed stock producers and ranchers, farmers in Alabama are responsible for producing quality genetics to go into the cow herd to produce the calves 
or to go into the bull studs that would be used to sire the calves that would then be producing high quality uh, food products. And so Alabama's role in the beef cattle industry is significant because we do supply a significant number of cattle to the entirety of that system. Uh, beef cattle in Alabama is extremely important because it has a very significant economic impact on the state. It's important for us to continue training our future leaders in the beef cattle industry and that's one of the important things that we do here at Auburn University. We have a study travel class. Our study travel program puts students on a bus and we travel across the state, we travel across the country looking at various areas of the industry and always when we come back from one of those week-long trips, one student will come into the office and they will make a comment like this. I didn't realize there was many jobs in the beef cattle industry that required coats and ties in lieu of boots and jeans. And so it is an amazing industry with tremendous amounts of opportunity, especially for those young minds that are gonna be our future leaders in the beef cattle industry in Alabama, across the nation, as well as across the world. Beef research here at Auburn University takes a look at meat safety and meat quality and so I have the best part of the job because I get to work with everybody um, across the whole animal industry from veterinarians to nutritionists, reproductive specialists. Um, the best product is beef and so um, all the end product comes to me and so that's why my job is so great here. I work with researchers, we look at nutritional supplements, we look at the food safety through animal challenges to make sure that if animals were infected with any pathogens that we're not going to find those in the meat. And so we get to look at it from a food safety standpoint. We also get to look at different supplements that may improve meat quality. And so it's a really awesome job to have the end product research here at Auburn. So we have an extension specialist who get to work with farmers who are already out there and of course we're training students here at Auburn and we're training them all the way from um, reproduction all the way through meat science and so with our curriculum at Auburn we try to get them into all of the classes that are production related and also expose them into meat science. Relax, right? So start here to pull together and you've got this so those students really have an understanding of the whole industry um, and they understand that no matter what part of the beef industry they're going into that it all ties together because our goal is to create the safest, most wholesome quality meat that we can. And so these students have an understanding from the beginning to the end when they're exposed to the meat science classes that we teach at Auburn. So, so we have cattlemen and cattlewomen that use all kinds of advanced technology these days. I, I work with some cattle producers that use drones to monitor their cattle herds. Uh, we certainly have better vaccine technology available to help prevent diseases. We have a lot of producers that use advanced reproductive techniques like artificial insemination and embryo transfer to help make more rapid genetic progress in their herds. So farming has come a long way, you know, it's really amazing to me when you look at where farming was, say, 50 years ago versus where it is now. You know, in 1950, 1960, the average American farmer fed about 26 people, and now today it's, it's over 150 people worldwide that one farmer feeds. So it's really amazing the advances in technology and the efficiency of production that a lot of people don't realize. So we have a lot to be thankful for in our farmers. What I'm doing right now is, is feeling the uterus to see if I can find any sign of an, of an early embryo. So at about between 32 and 35 days, that embryo is about the size of a, like an English pea. And then of course it gets bigger from there, but, but we, we feel for the, for the fetus or the embryo, and based on the size of that, we can estimate how far along 
that, uh, that pregnancy is. There are a lot of opportunities for people to engage in, in careers in the animal industry. There's, there's nutritional opportunities, you know, as nutritional consultants working for nutritional companies. There are opportunities to work for pharmaceutical companies that uh, help manufacture, produce, distribute vaccines, dewormers, the medicines that we use to help keep our animals healthy. There are a lot of opportunities. And, you know, it's estimated that, that we're going to need double the food production in the next 40 or 50 years. That means there's going to, that's, that's a big challenge, number one, but it's also a great opportunity for, for people to engage in, in, in the agricultural industry. So what you're going to do is uncap it and then you're going to take that top part. Uh, one of the scientists in the department is working on reproductive efficiency to be able to get more cows pregnant every year so that we don't have to maintain the cow without her having a producing offspring. Uh, some of the things that our scientists are doing is looking at forage quality, the growth of the plant, the quantity of plant growth, and how that plant is available then to feed that animal that was gonna transform that grass into an edible food product for the consuming public. And so this kind of technology continuing to has to be developed if we're to maintain a high quality uh, food for the world. So this part of the work that we're doing here at Auburn University relates to us understanding the genetic properties of the heifer infertilities. As in other words, why those heifers don't become pregnant as they enter their first breeding season. This is an area that heavily relates to the cow-calf production. So there are many cows or many heifers that are specifically selected for the production of a calf. And because this is an area where this is highly concentrated, uh, we're working to try and um, have given opportunity for those farmers to identify those heifers at very early or young age and select those heifers that are not going to become pregnant and reroute them to a different purpose other than producing a calf at really early ages. Infertility is a big problem in Alabama because every year we have approximately 120,000 heifers entering the system, the production system, and approximately 5% of those heifers, 5 to 10% of those heifers will not become pregnant. No matter what we do in terms of management, however good the management is, those heifers will not become pregnant. And we're trying to identify those heifers and avoid perhaps a loss of approximately $2 million for a cattleman and cattlewoman here in Alabama. Most of the yield increases that we've seen in Alabama and across the world have come because of research and making sure that research gets out to our producers. If we are going to feed our growing population, we need to be able to increase production. That only comes by doing relevant research and then making sure that research gets out to our undergraduates in the classroom, but also to our adults who are out in the farm. In Alabama, research has been going on since the start of Auburn University as the land-grant university. Extension started in 1912, making sure that the university came out to the farmer, came out to our rural communities, that those agents were embedded, living in the community, and they were available to visit with people. I don't care if it was at church, at the football game, or at the grocery store, or at the office. They were always available to provide research-based information that was relevant to the local needs and based upon those long-term relationships. The beef industry in Alabama has a $1.2 billion impact on the state. Here at E.V. Smith, 
we manage a beef herd for animal research for Auburn University. Cattle ranching in Alabama has changed over the last 25 years. We have moved from being grandpa's farm to using more technology. Here at the beef unit, we use GPS guided tractors to plant forages in overseeding pastures. We do soil samples on a routine basis. Technology is helping make the farmer better and smarter and more profitable than ever before. Auburn University has done extensive research related to beef cattle production and ways to improve efficiency for Alabama beef producers. So specifically, we're focused on looking at a systems approach to improving Alabama livestock production. So what that means is essentially we're looking at ways to improve management practices on producer farms. A few examples of that are by focusing on improved nutrition programs for beef cattle production especially related to forage management and supplemental feeding during the winter months. Also related to health management programs, as well as economic management considerations in their operations. Forage production represents a great opportunity for beef producers in Alabama. We're blessed in Alabama that we have a largely mild climate, which allows us to grow forages nearly year round. Forages make up the base for beef cattle diets in Alabama, and so we want to maximize their use in order to reduce overall carrying costs of cows throughout the year. Here at the E.B. Smith Beef Unit, we're focused on looking at forage production systems that can reduce those management costs for a producer during the winter months. Today we're going to be looking at a research project where we're evaluating cool season annuals versus two winter supplemental feeding options as a way to potentially reduce labor and improve animal performance during the winter months. Over the last month, we've had several cold snaps in Alabama. You can see that the tips of some of this forage is frost damaged, so it has a little bit of a light tan appearance or a bleached appearance to it. So that just shows that this forage was set back a little bit by that cold weather, but as the weather continues to warm up to above 50 degrees, we'll see a lot more active growth. The project we're looking at today contains a mixture of oats, annual ryegrass and crimson clover, which are all cool season annual forages. These are very high quality and nutritious forages for beef cattle. And so they're desirable for people to use during the winter months because they can support good animal growth as well as provide an alternative system to having to feed hay and supplemental feeds during the winter months. This is oats. Oats are a small grain and they're very palatable to cattle, so they like to eat these. Also, you can tell that it's oats because it has a much wider leaf blade than that of the ryegrass that's in this mixture. So here's some of the, the ryegrass that's coming up. Oats and ryegrass tend to grow well in a mixture together because oats provide earlier grazing in the winter than our ryegrass will. Ryegrass is going to become more productive later in the spring months as we move into the early summer months. As a graduate research assistant at Auburn University, I help conduct research in our program relating to beef cattle forages and nutrition. I have several projects going on that relate to beef nutrition and specifically the one we're looking at today is looking at winter grazing or uh, supplemental feed systems during the winter months. And my job as a graduate student is to collect data on this project and take that back to the department consolidate that information into a way that we can present it to producers and let them know how they can use these different systems that we're studying 
to work on their operation. To measure forage production in this grazing system, we collect samples using a calibration rising plate meter and we walk across the field. We can take measurements of the forage growth and that can give us an estimate of the forage production uh, that we get in that particular paddock. Another way to measure forage production is to use a grazing stick. A grazing stick is a tool that a producer can use walking across their paddocks taking measurements of heights of the forages that are there, and they can use the information on the grazing stick to estimate the forage production that's uh, in that particular area. Once they have an estimate of the forage production, they can determine the stocking rate or the number of animals to put on that paddock to utilize that forage. I'm actually from a non-agriculture background I started my education at a small agriculture college in South Georgia, and then I uh, got involved with the Cattlemen's Association there and really started to learn more about beef cattle and the industry. Uh, I became interested in beef cattle nutrition by interning with an extension agent in Georgia, and that led me to pursue the option of graduate school, where I contacted Dr. Mullinex to learn more about the research that she has going on relating to beef cattle nutrition and forages. And from that uh, meeting, I determined that I would come to grad school here and pursue an ex a career in extension. In this study, we're looking at different supplemental feeding strategies for carrying beef cows through the winter. We're trying to look at labor reduced options to do that. So by either reducing the frequency that we feed animals during the week, but also looking at ways to improve their hay use efficiency. This is a modified cone ring and you can see that it helps improve their use of the hay by keeping the hay more concisely in the ring and reduces the waste out of the edges of the ring. On this project, in order to uh, determine the nutritional value of the forages that we have here, we take uh, hand clip samples, so we'll go out and take a random sample in the field of a fresh forage. We'll take that back to our lab at Auburn. And we will dry those forages, grind them, And then we'll run wet chemistry um, lab work on them to determine things such as uh, crude protein or total digestible nutrients so that we can give that information to a producer and they can use that to determine if the forage is meeting the cattle's needs. Um, and that's all things that we can do right there in our lab and get that information turned around quickly. My experience at Auburn has really been a, a great experience. I've gotten so many opportunities to um, meet people across the state in the field of extension as well as in the industry and cattle producers. Really networking has been the biggest thing uh, that I've gotten out of my experience here. I enjoy the research that I do. I enjoy the camaraderie in the department. We really are like a family here uh, and we can do things that are helping producers to be more efficient um, to care for their animals and produce a great product. The Auburn Animal Sciences program is a great program that would allow you to come and learn more about beef production in Alabama. And ultimately, there are several different jobs that you can have in the agricultural field related to animal production systems. Scientists, research technicians, pharmaceutical services, veterinary services are just a few examples of some of the jobs that students in our department have whenever they leave our program. Also, there's extensive opportunities to become more involved in the beef industry as a whole. So maybe from the way of public relations or management, 
within some of these industry organizations are potential ways that students can become involved in the agriculture industry. On Curtis Farms, we have about 152 mama cows and we're a cow-calf operation. We run uh, um, one bull per 25 to 30 head. Um, and we also um, uh, have Angus and Hereford bulls right now. The beef product in Alabama is, is as good as anywhere in that, first of all, we're all forage farmers to begin with. They're all grass fed at some point. We wean our calves about eight months and then they're, they're fed with grain for about 45 to 60 days. And that really makes the, the marbling and it makes it very tender and, and juicy and, and it, it is, it's as good as anywhere. Um, there have been some studies done where the, the meat in the southeast has been tested against that in the Midwest and everything and, and you know when it's, when it's a cooked steak on, steak on the plate you can't tell the difference where it came from. Auburn University has been very helpful in, in our industry, in, in area, any area that you look at, in that um, they, they help us, to, they have beef um, um, teaching units where um, they teach us how to raise the right kind of forage for our cattle. They also have um, any kinds of workshops that help us to, to pick good bulls, you know, how to look at EPDs, to, to choose good bulls. that that make our operation go the direction we want it to go. Um, they also help us in, in nutrition and how to take care of our cattle and also even in how we sell our cattle. They, they do uh, workshops on um, you know, marketing and that sort of thing and, and what we have in our operation and the direction that we want to go. You know, as an individual, you choose what direction you want to go. You can pick up the phone and call anybody at Auburn in, in, the, uh, in the Ag Department and, and get an answer for whatever problem you're having. Anybody that, that wants to, that doesn't know what they want to do, first of all, I would say go visit a farm, you know, and just, just get a general idea of what goes on on a farm because so many people are so removed from, from that concept. But if you go to Auburn, it, there is so many things, so many areas that you could go into, you know. Um, first of all, you have, of course, like I say, we grow grass first, so in, anything in the agronomy end in being able to grow grass. Then you have the, the marketing, you have actually the growing, the nutrition, uh, feeds, you know, um, that, that sort of thing. You also have the processing, you know, the meat industry. You have Dr. Bratcher that has, has you know, all the, the kids in meat sites. And, you know, they compete all over, you know, in, in the meat sites, in competitions and stuff. Um, so then you, then you also have the grocery end, um, not just the meat, the processing part, but the grocery end and, and the areas that, that it goes there. Not only that, but none of the cow is wasted in the process. So there are parts of it that are used in everything. It's, it's just a worldwide, you know, opportunity uh, for whatever interest, you know, a, a student. They, they can, you know, it, it's kind of, you know, everybody says, um, you know, a job is not a job if you love what you do. And, and so that you just need to get out and experience to realize what you love to do.
Here at Auburn University, we do a, a great deal of research on poultry, and specifically chicken that's raised for, for consumption. And this uh, really fits Auburn University very well. You know, Alabama is the second largest broiler or chicken meat producer in the United States. And this chicken meat is the largest agricultural sector in Alabama, accounting for about 60% of all uh, agricultural sales in the state. So we are uh, committed to improving uh, research in this area and becoming, a, in fact, a leading program in, in the nation in this area. The Poultry Science Department at Auburn University is only one of six poultry science departments in the United States. Uh, one of the reasons that we're here in Alabama is that the poultry industry is the number one agribusiness in the state of Alabama. It contributes nearly $16 billion to the economy um, in the state of Alabama. By some estimates, that's about one-eighth of the GDP for the whole state. So there's a great need for a workforce. There's a great need for new knowledge and technology. And there's a great need for continuing education for the workforce. And we play a role in all three of those areas. We have a strong instructional program where we educate students, give them great background, where they can make an impact when they go out and work at, in the industry. Uh, we grow chickens very quickly now. Um, it's one of the most efficient animals in converting plant materials into high quality pro protein, either through meat or through eggs. Um, there are a lot of uh, uh, certain restrictions and certain ethnic groups on diets. Uh, we don't see that with poultry. So poultry is moving toward probably the number one meat product consumed, not only in the United States, which it already is, but throughout the world. So in probably the next 10 years, it will be the protein of choice throughout the world. So there's a great need for a workforce, there's a great need for new knowledge and technology, and there's a great need for continuing education for the workforce. And we play a role in all three of those areas. We have a strong instructional program where we educate students, give them great background where they can make an impact when they go out and work at, in the industry. Our starting salaries for those students are exceedingly good. For graduates coming out this past year, they were in the mid-50s as starting salary. Uh, most of them had at least three job offers, if not as many as five or six job offers, uh, mostly here in the state of Alabama, but also in the Southeast region, going to Arkansas, North Carolina, Georgia, uh, Mississippi. So there's a great opportunity for students, once they get the BS degree, to enter into a great career track. Uh, we are in a facility here doing this, which is, supports our research efforts. So we're developing new knowledge that helps the industry stay strong economically. We help sustain that industry through our new research and new knowledge and technology. Uh, and then also we're able to bring industry personnel here and train them on the latest technologies and science so that we stay on the cutting edge in terms of agricultural practices. We were formed by the Board of Trustees about uh, almost exactly 10 years ago with the idea that there are a lot of problems that face our state's poultry farmers that are more uh, on the farm related than in the laboratory related. So one of the first issues we started uh, dealing with was the cost of fuel. The Alabama poultry uh, grower must burn propane gas in cool weather to, in, and in cold weather to, because we have to have a specific temperatures in the houses. And so we put in on a program to help teach growers how to winterize their houses and, and how to be more efficient with the types of heating systems they use. And we estimate that we saved growers in energy 
uh, costs somewhere about $12 million per year, every year for the last 10 years. I help support poultry growers with problems on their farms. We support poultry companies with problems in their complexes. Um, and we, we filled a lot of phone calls. We answer questions via email, uh, helping farmers improve their energy efficiency, troubleshoot their uh, farming troubles. Um, and one of the things that this building that we're in now gives us the capability to do is when we have a grower that has a problem, uh, a lot of times being in Auburn, we're an hour away from many poultry farms. So in this building here, I can put my hands on equipment and I can manipulate equipment or I can troubleshoot problems here on this farm and give a grower an answer and help a grower real time with it that same day. Many farmers that are new farmers have the ability to install electronic controllers in their operations to where they can monitor and they can adjust anything in their poultry houses with a iPhone or iPad or an Android phone. So they can be at home and if they get an alarm at night, they can wake up and they can check their, phone, their farm from their phone at home and not have to get up. A lot of times it's a good idea to go and check the, the houses to make sure everything's working right. But with this new technology, it saves the farmer time for nuisance alarms and things like that. But he can also fine tune the control of those buildings from a phone. So what we're trying to show in this uh, video is basically the operation of a modern radiant brooder. Uh, these brooders hang five feet off the ground, they uh, combust fuel and they radiate heat down to the chicks where they heat the floor. Uh, what we're trying to show with smoke is through smoke tracing we can show how much of the heat goes up to the ceiling through convection uh, and we can see how that heat is trapped uh, up to the ceiling uh, where we would use a secondary ventilation system, a stir fan, to blow that heat back down and, and get a second use out of it. So that's one of the technologies that the Natural Poultry Technology Center developed is looking at ways to get reuse out of that heat and improve our efficiency. Technology at Auburn has advanced in a number of areas. Our thrusts are in the areas of nutrition, health, environment and house management, and uh, food safety. So we have moved ahead in all those areas. Uh, consumer interests have changed in that time period and we've tried to change with that in what people would like to see in their foodstuffs. We're in the research feed mill at Auburn University, which is used for a number of animals, but primarily for poultry. Uh, we had in the past a feed mill to make research feeds, and we need to be able to make very accurate research feeds to be able to test feed ingredients, feed additives, and things like that. What we have now is a facility where we can also do feed milling research, figure out how to make feed better for chickens more efficiently, uh, feed that is, has less toxins in it, things like that. In addition, this facility is very good for teaching about feed milling. What many people don't realize about the poultry industry in Alabama, it is a large industry with a multitude of, of different technology and jobs available. Uh, there are jobs in uh, health, there are jobs in people management, there are jobs in uh, food safety and quality. So m most business and technical type of jobs that you can think of are available to, in the Alabama poultry industry for people who want to uh, start a career in that area. Right now we are consuming about 90 to 91 pounds of poultry meat per year in, per capita in this country. And because of that increase in the demand, our poultry industry has really worked hard to improve the genetics of the birds, improve the nutrition of the bird, and to get uh, the higher meat yielding birds. However, during that period, we, uh, we had some meat quality issues that came up. These are, uh, these are not food safety issues, mind you. These are just meat quality issues. And so meat sometimes can become tough and chewy. It took me about like 20 years of training and research and finding 
to come up with these simple yet innovative uh, methods that can help our industry. So, uh, for example, the, the innovation to detect woody breast using a handheld device came from the idea that I had done a lot of biochemistry work on, uh, on chickens and on fish. And I figured out that there are biochemical differences in the meat as the, as the bird is growing or as the bro broiler is growing at a different rate or as the meat uh, quality changes. So what is, uh, what is woody breast or wooden breast myopathy? Wooden breast myopathy is a condition that is occurring in the breast fillets of fast growing big birds, especially birds that are eight to nine pound uh, live weight. What happens in the woody breast myopathy or wooden breast myopathy is that the, there is a proliferation of collagen. There is extra collagen, there is a cross-linking of collagen that leads to tough and uh, chewy uh, meat at times. And that is uh, termed as a woody breast or a wooden breast myopathy. That is causing, uh, is a major cause of concern in the poultry industry at this moment. The same thing with uh, functional ice. I actually stayed and, uh, and did research on Kodiak Island, Alaska on studying the spoilage of pink salmon. Before that, I studied spoilage microbiology and spoilage biochemistry in India. And so based on all the knowledge that I had gained, I came up with this uh, innovative idea and, uh, as functional ice that is very, uh, very easy to use, very simplistic, yet highly advanced, and that can change and help our poultry as well as catfish industry and the seafood industry in the state of Alabama. What ice is doing is as it is melting, it is just uh, providing a cooling effect versus with our functional ice that we have developed, it is a sustained uh, release mechanism wherein we have added certain ingredients that are regarded as safe by the FDA, USDA, they're used routinely and uh, we have used them to make, uh, make a solution into ice. And as that ice is applied on fish or chicken, this ice, uh, as a regular ice does, it will start melting. As it is melting, it will uh, have a sustained release of that antimicrobial over the fish or the chicken that is being stored or transported. And that, in turn, will prevent the product from spoiling. You will increase the shelf life. You can increase the reach of the market. You can actually prevent the fish from going bad. And at the same time, the ingredients that we have chosen are such that uh, it will provide a lower uh, cooling temperatures. So that way, it can provide an enhanced cooling effect, at the same time having an active suppression of the, uh, suppression of the bacteria during the storage and transportation. The birds themselves have changed a lot through selective breeding. So the application of, of, of genetics, of, of scientific genetics breeding, uh, but it's all classical selective breeding with birds. It's basically you breed the best ones to the best ones and you get, you know, depending on what you decide is the characteristics you want. The largest uh, poultry breeding company in the world's U.S. headquarters is here in Alabama, Aviagens in Huntsville, Alabama. We work with them uh, uh, a lot, and a lot of our students go to work for Aviagen. So there's opportunities there for students to work in the poultry breeding side of things, poultry genetics, very high-tech industry. Um, the work that we do here and at other poultry research facilities around the country over the past 25 years led to improvements in health of the birds, welfare of the birds, of course the growth of the birds. Everybody always concentrates on that and the public thinks of chickens as growing so fast and they do because we've been breeding them to grow fast for the last hundred years. And uh, universities and the application of scientific breeding principles has contributed to that. The other major contribution has been in nutrition, scientific nutrition. We know more about the nutrition of broiler chickens than we do any other animal on the planet, including humans. There's sort of three, three legs to the whole poultry equation, and that's genetics, nutrition, and health. And poultry health has improved tremendously through the, through the network of diagnostic labs we have in the state that diagnose diseases, and the poultry researchers that we have who have developed vaccines and uh, treatments for and prevention. Poultry industry pr 
primarily operates on prevention of disease, not treating disease. This department exists in large part because of the contributions of one particular researcher, S. Allen Edgar, who developed a vaccine for a, a poultry parasitic disease called, called coccidiosis. And that vaccine uh, is still a very large uh, seller in the world today. It's a, an important tool to maintain health of poultry flocks. Uh, Auburn benefited greatly from that. Uh, the poultry industry benefited greatly, greatly from that. Uh, we have other people on faculty, uh, Dr. Jambrone, Dr. Houck, who are poultry health specialists. We do have people here, virologists, molecular virologists here working at the, at the very sharp end of molecular biology, uh, designing vaccines for prevention of things like avian influenza, other poultry diseases that, that are a major threat to the poultry industry. The poultry industry uh, contracts with private growers to grow their chickens. Most poultry companies own no farms themselves. They contract with private, so it's a very family farm oriented business. So of course there's thousands of family poultry farms in Alabama and, and some of our students come from those farms and they intend to go back to those farms and raise poultry themselves. But that's just the very tip of the iceberg with the whole poultry, with, the, with employment in the poultry industry. Poultry industry uh, is a highly integrated industry, vertically inter integrated industry, meaning they do everything from, go from raw materials to the finished product within the company, and they contract for the growth of the birds. So they have people, the sort of the quintessential poultry industry job that most people are aware of is a broiler service technician, where that someone goes to work for the poultry company, and then they go out to farms, they're assigned a certain number of farms, and they provide technical help to the farmer. There's no such thing as the chicken business, there's people business in everything. So, so if, you, if you like animals, if you like science, if you like technology, if you're willing to work hard and you can deal with people, you have a, a really huge opportunity in the poultry industry. I'm the third generation farmer in, in my family. I have four broiler houses, they're 55 by 500 foot houses. Uh, I, as of right now, I house 25,500 birds per house. I try to keep my farm up to date with all of the, the newest technologies that come out. If, if it can help me produce a better product and save money, I, I try to do it and I don't want to have to do a, a lot of upgrades as as my houses get older and, and all that, so I try to keep everything in good shape and up to date. I try to practice strong biosecurity here on my farm. I, I've actually got automatic gates to where you come into my, my farm, so just anybody can't come onto my farm. You also, if you come onto my farm, you have to fill out a, a questionnaire saying what farm you've been to last, or where you've been, how, how long it's been. You have to wear coveralls and a hairnet and uh, plastic boots, you know, entering my farm and, and being on my farm. I also have stuff that you step on inside my, my chicken houses. It's a, a chlorine powder-like substance that you have to step on where you don't carry disease from house to house. The birds are safer uh, today than they were before, especially with the technology and all. We, I have computer systems in my houses and alarm systems. If, if something goes wrong, if uh, the temperature gets to a certain temperature or a certain set point, uh, either too high or too low, um, it'll call my phone and tell me what it is if a, a feed line is out, or, um, and uh, it'll call my phone and, and all that. We're actually doing a, a trial test and all through Auburn as of right now on my farm where they, uh, they collect data off of my water usage and my fans and all that and they keep it up to, to see how I can, you know, become a, a better farmer in a more efficient way and all.
The poultry industry in Alabama is about a $15.1 billion economic impact for the state of Alabama. We employ about 86,000 workers in the state of Alabama. Uh, we process about 21 million chickens a week in Alabama. At any one time, there's approximately uh, about uh, 200 million chickens uh, at farms in Alabama. Three things have mainly changed the poultry industry in Alabama over the last 25 years, and that's improvements in uh, genetics of the birds, where we select the birds. We select birds with bigger breast bones or longer breast bones. We select birds that have strong skeletal structures that are able to hold up the extra weight we put on birds now compared to 25 years ago. And uh, just genetics, the next thing we've done is nutritionally. We know what the birds need to uh, get the maximum growth out of the birds. Uh, we know the uh, environment they have to be in. And that is what uh, we have uh, found also is a housing has changed so much in 25 years. Where a house uh, 25 years ago cost maybe 10 to $20,000 per house, our modern houses now cost anywhere from $300,000 to $500,000 per house. The environment in our poultry houses is ideal for growth of these birds. Temperature never varies more than three degrees at any time during the day inside the poultry house. It never fails whenever I'm on an uh, airplane or anything like that, sit, sit next to somebody and they find out I'm in the poultry bin and said, oh yeah, y'all are the guys that give all those steroids and hormones to chickens. Well, we've never done that. It's, to start with, it's against the law to uh, feed hormones to, to chickens. The other thing about hormones, they have to be injected. Well, you can't inject 21 million chickens a week with things like that, so it's just not uh, manageable in our poultry business. A chicken is raised anywhere from 32 days up to a maximum of about 60 days of age. So the hormones wouldn't even have time to take effect if we tried to use it in our poultry. One of the things that is a huge uh, advantage to our poultry is that we have Auburn University here in Alabama. We have about 80 students involved right now in the poultry science curriculum at Auburn University. Uh, we'll, we will graduate anywhere from 10 to 15 of those students per year and most of those students have anywhere from three to four job opportunities uh, as they graduate. So it's not a choice of are you going to get a job when you graduate, it's what part of the industry do I want to go into. I think the future of the poultry industry in Alabama is just wide open. It can certainly grow, grow a lot in the future we feel like. Uh, we have areas of Alabama, again, uh, I've told you earlier, we have about 21 million chickens processed in Alabama. We're only in about 46 of the 67 counties in Alabama. So there's a lot of counties that don't have poultry in their counties and they would love to have it because it is, uh, again, with the housing costs they are today, it used to be a full-time job looking after chickens. Uh, but now because of the technology and all that we have, it'll call you on your phone if something happens at the house where we used to have to be at the chicken house at all times. As long as you're close by, you can get there before anything bad happens. We have generators there if the electricity goes off. Uh, they will run the poultry house until you get there. So people can do some other jobs in with like row crops now, with cattle, with aquaculture, with different things like that and still have a poultry farm to supplement your income. Food safety in the produce is important. It's extremely important in our livestock and poultry industries because what happens on the farm will continue to impact the quality now, and safety of those meat products once they're processed. So we're working with poultry producers, beef producers, fish producers, oyster producers to make sure that their production techniques maximizes their yields, optimizes their profitability, and maximizes the safety of their product. Farmers today, they're, they're an amazing group. You know, you have to be a, a, a bit of a scientist to operate the equipment that they operate today. You have to be a, a great uh, business manager to, to deal with the volatility they face. And so it takes a special group of, uh, of skills to be successful. You have to be an entrepreneur and a risk taker and willing to live with the risks that Mother Nature deals out to you. You know, often when I'm talking to farmers, farmers like to talk about their land and their property, and they take great pride in their, in their land, and they're, they're great stewards of the resources that they, they manage. And 
They're interested in, in managing these resources in a way such that they're of value to the next generation that may take over their farm. But I think many are just very interested in maintaining these resources uh, for, the, for the betterment of society. And so our job at Auburn University is to help farmers in doing that. And we also work with, with governments and, and other entities to help make sure that we are protecting the environment. Often the, the toughest problems we face in production agriculture today lie at that intersection between agriculture and the environment. And we want to make sure that we, we're doing our part to develop new solutions for farmers to give them the technology and knowledge they need to be better stewards of their land.